glad to sit down here. Good evening. I'm Joe Nye, Dean of the Kennedy School, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this forum on Beyond Sweatshops, yeah. the Invisible Workforce in the Global Economy. Uh, we're delighted to be sponsoring this and co-sponsoring this with the Radcliffe Institute of Public Policy, and in a minute I will introduce the director, Paula Raymond. But I wanted to say just a word uh, before that about the importance of this topic. Uh, if one thinks of half of the world's workforce and the importance of utilizing it and the fact that it is not adequately utilized or recognized, you know the importance of the subject we're dealing with tonight. I have been struck uh, by a recent uh, uh, example of this, which was based originally on the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh, which of course has provided microfinance to Bangladeshi women, which has allowed them to develop talents and entrepreneurial skills in villages. And uh, recently, uh, there has been an addition to that, which is Grameen Phone, in which uh, women have gotten microfinance for buying a cellular phone. And the result of this is that in several, uh, I believe close to a thousand villages, and it's still growing, uh, but let's say nearly a thousand villages in Bangladesh, you have women who have borrowed money to purchase a phone, have rented the phone for calls to their fellow villagers, the husbands have often found it profitable to set up a tea shop for the queue of people who are waiting to use the <laughs> phone. And you've had villages connected with each other, which would have not been connected for another 10 or 20 years if you waited for the government to string copper wires to actually make these connections. In other words, if you can unleash this extraordinary power, there are amazing things that can be done. Uh, indeed, one of the great hopes is that uh, as we think about this, is the prospects of leapfrogging, of essentially moving ahead faster than the pace of history in the past. So the subject of the invisible workforce in a global economy uh, has to be one in which we're all deeply concerned. And we're fortunate to have uh, such a great panel that Martha, Martha Chen is going to moderate and has, been, uh, has brought together. But uh, to introduce it, let me turn to Paula Raymond, who is director of the Radcliffe Institute of Public Policy. Paula. Good evening, and I'd like to welcome all of you to this event. As uh, uh, Dean Nye just said, the title is Beyond Sweatshops, the Invisible Workforce in the Global Economy. And we at the Radcliffe Public Policy Center are particularly pleased to be co-sponsoring this event with WeGo, which is the Women in Formal Employment Globalizing and Organizing Organization, and the Kennedy Schools Institute for Politics Student Advisory Committee. Tonight, we will be hearing from four prominent women leaders from around our globe who are members of WeGo as they together with all of us seek to better understand the struggles of workers in the informal sector of our economy globally and also to give us new research questions to work on and to help us form new public policies for women that are struggling in this sector. The struggles of low-income women and their families have been a particular concern to us at the Radcliffe Public Policy Center since our inception in 1994. We have been focusing on research efforts on issues that connect work and life and concerns of women in their caring unpaid roles as well as their paid formal roles. Tonight's panel features women activists from India, South Africa, and the Philippines. In addition, Professor Richard Freeman will serve as our astute discussant. And Martha Chen will moderate this panel from her particular vantage point. She is our Matina Horner Visiting Professor of Public Policy this year at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study 
and she is also a lecturer in public policy here at the Kennedy School. I want to just tell you a little bit about Marty because she really deserves our applause for her noteworthy work for um, pushing ahead the advancement of women's issues across our globe. Marty has a PhD in South Asian Regional Studies from the University of Pennsylvania and is fluent in Hindi, Urdu, and Bengali. She has written extensively on development issues and has produced case studies of selected development projects for women and public policy documents which integrate women into the mainstream of development programs. Since she joined Harvard University in 1987, Marty has taught courses here on international development and pursued policy research on women's economic role in development she started a program on the role of non-governmental organizations in international development and co-founded WeGo. Marty's work at Radcliffe has focused on the work and lives of women and their families in the informal economy. We look forward to continuing our work together. I would also like to thank Acting Dean Mary Maples Dunn who wanted to be with us here tonight, but is waylaid on a runway at LaGuardia Airport as we speak, since Mother Nature did not quite cooperate with us this evening, but she wanted us to send her best to this event. It is now with great pleasure that I introduce to you Marty Chu. I too would like to express my welcome to all of you and my thanks to <coughs> Dean Nye, to Dean Dunn in absentia, and to Paula Raymond from the Radcliffe Public Policy Center for co-sponsoring this event tonight. It is my great pleasure and privilege to introduce the topic as well as our panelists here tonight. We chose the title Beyond Sweatshops, the Invisible Workforce in a Global Economy for a special reason. Beyond sweatshops, we are very pleased that we have consumer groups and student groups in this country and elsewhere that help, have helped focus our attention on sweatshop workers around the world. But we also know that there are other very large segments of the informal economy, those who work on the streets and those who work from their homes. And we also know that their lives and conditions should also be of great concern. So our focus here tonight is the working poor women who are not working in the sweatshops, but those who are working from their homes and from the streets. Who are we actually talking about? The working poor who earn their income outside the formal economy can be categorized into three groups, perhaps. One are those who are owners of small unregistered businesses. They get much of the attention of the microfinance revolution. But there are also a whole range of self-employed producers and traders. And then there are the very wide range of wage workers who work under different kinds of insecure and unprotected employment relations. Why should we be concerned about the informal economy? Our estimates suggest that in the developing world, anywhere from half of the total workforce to perhaps as high as 85% of the total workforce in some countries works outside the formal economy. If you begin to think about women, you find that nine out of 10 women work in the informal economy in most countries of Africa, in most countries of South Asia, and also in Indonesia. We are also concerned about global integration and global competition and what this means for these categories of workers. Clearly, global integration is creating more opportunities for some, but it is also increasing insecurity and vulnerability for others. 
particularly for those who are the least visible and the least powerful in the global system. For those, if you will, who are at the lowest rungs of the global economic ladder. What greater contrast could there be in terms of knowledge, access, and power in the global marketplace than between the large multinational brand name companies and the women or the woman who produces from her home? With us here tonight are a group of activists and researchers who belong to the WeGo network. Um, at our peak earlier this week, we were over 85 from about 30 countries. And who is our panel? Our panel is comprised of four remarkable women from this network. All of them are activists, but as you will gather from the in introductions, they are more than activists. And they are going to share their experience and perspectives on organizing women in different parts of the developing world. I will introduce all of the panelists and then um, turn the floor over to them. To my immediate left is Ila Bhatt. Ila Bhatt is the founder of a remarkable trade union called the Self-Employed Women's Association in India. She is a lawyer by training she is a respected leader in several international movements, and I will mention each of them. In the labor movement, in the cooperative movement, in the women's movement, and in the microfinance movement. She is the winner of several national and international awards. She is currently a trustee of the Rockefeller Foundation. She is a former member of parliament in India and she is a former member of the Planning Commission of India. To her left is Pat Horn, who's the founder of an organization, another trade union modeled on Sewa, called Sewu, which is the self-employed women's union in Durban, South Africa. She is also the coordinator of a growing international alliance of street vendor organizations, uh, an international alliance called StreetNet. She is a South African trade unionist. Pat took an active role in the anti-apartheid struggle of the 70s and 80s. I learned when I was in Durban in April this year that she was banned for five years along with 27 other trade unionists. For five years she could not work and was not supposed to meet or talk with any of her colleagues. And she has played an active role in the ANC's women's leagues in the early 90s until she then took time out to form Sewu. Lucy Lazo, to her left, is the director for a center that, looks, uh, that studies the informal economy in the Philippines. And she is a trustee of another international alliance, the International Alliance of Home-Based Workers called HomeNet. And she was the former chief technical advisor of a regional ILO project on home-based workers. And I think she was uh, in that capacity for quite a number of years and really put uh, home-based workers in Southeast Asia on the map. To her left is Reynana Javala, the national coordinator of SEWA and secretary of the National Center for Labor in India. She is a trustee of the International Alliance of Home-Based Workers, HomeNet. She's a winner of the Padma Shri, a very prestigious national award in India. And I hasten to add, or perhaps I shouldn't hasten to add, that she is an undergraduate, I mean, she's a graduate of Harvard in mathematics and went on to do Ye uh, economics at Yale. <laughs> but she is a trade unionist um, at heart. Also with us here this evening is Richard Freeman, the Herbert Asherman Professor of Economics at Harvard University. And we're particularly delighted that he's here because he is the faculty co-chair of the trade union program at Harvard. And he's the director of labor studies at the National Bureau of Economic Research. And so we are delighted that he agreed to um, respond to our panelists' perspectives and experience. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Uh, friends, uh, thanks for having us. Um, 
Let me start my talk with the words of a woman in Zilimili village in India. So it's a song which says, Kaj nahi, kaj kori maru. So it's a Bengali. So it means that when there is no work, the grind of work is killing me. I think she has perfectly captured the condition of the women in the informal economy. A number of times I have heard Seva women describe their work as, say, as if they are grinding sand, meaning toiling hard and producing nothing. I have seen women in Jabalpur rolling beads, cigarettes, and earning zero. Women in the hills carrying backload more than their own body weight, earning next to nothing. So Seva was born out of the concern for such women, and we go. Uh, so our, so our global coalition is also suffering from the same concerns. As problems have globalized, the solutions uh, also lie at the global level. The, the world is changing, and, and scholars like you are accelerating the pace of change by influencing the policy makers worldwide. You have the power over the powerless. While organizing these women, um, Seva arrived at a point to determine the exactly what do the women want, what do the poor want. And we understand that when they ask for work, they ask for full employment. Full employment, I mean, please forgive me so if I dare to I mean, defined because it is your prerogative, but I'm trying to <laughs> get into that. Full employment, uh, as, uh, as based on our experience, is that employment that ensures food security, income security, social security. So social security, so that includes at least healthcare, childcare, and shelter. And this, uh, I mean, full employment at the household level. So Seva's goal is to attain full employment at the household level of our, of our women members. We urge the trade unions, cooperatives, so, and women's organizations, so, our governments, so, and universities I mean, like you, to participate actively in the struggle for full employment at the household level, a more human life and social justice. Full employment has to be the foundation stone of any moral and rational economic model. The society which leaves millions unemployed cannot morally justify its economic systems, no matter high growth. Gandhi asked and called the economic poverty a moral collapse of the affluent. Uh, the link between poverty and growth is employment. The value of employment both for individuals and for our societies is very high. Therefore, I would like to strongly emphasize something that is evident to trade unionists, but which is not understood by our governments and which is questioned by our experts, and that is the right to work for every adult able-bodied person is a fundamental demand that cannot be compromised. We reject economic theories in which unemployment is not considered a deep human tragedy, but merely one instrument among, say, among several instruments for fighting inflation. <laughs> but the tragedy of the issue of employment is deeper and complex. So, and the millions in workforce, um, economically very active, are under parda. They are invisible, hence not recognized as part of the working population. It is unfortunate that the world of work is, so, so is divided, formal sector, informal sector, public sector, private sector, employed, self-employed. So I do not know so who divided the world of work like this. <laughs> or, I mean, who decides who is formal and, and who is informal? Who decides, I mean, who is central and, and who is peripheral or, or marginal? But whatever the reason, it is true that this divide has done a big, everlasting damage to the vast working population of the world. This vast 
Excluded majority consists of those who, who are producers, laborers, entrepreneurs, as you mentioned. Uh, therefore, our first concern is that how do we ensure enough income or uh, how do we ensure enough income earning work throughout the year for them? Secondly, what policies, actions, programs will create m multiple choices and opportunities of sustained work? And how do we ensure a fair return to their work? This is the challenge uh, all of us have to answer. Uh, and my other point is that uh, we require an international organizing strategy. And that strategy requires the feminization of trade union movement and cooperative movement. Who are the majority of workers working in the unorganized area and, and in precarious work? They are women in the, in the urban and rural informal sector. They are immigrant workers, they are women. I mean, like domestic workers, service workers, garment workers, earning foreign exchange for the country at the cost of their own well-being, at the cost of their children. So they are not in developing countries only. They are also also in the, in the industrialized countries as well. So if we are serious to organize millions of workers in the world uh, of, the, of the informal sector, we have to realize the fact that Without a thorough ongoing change in its priorities, it will not be possible. We have to change the organizing methods, change the staffing of the trade union movement, and there is necessity of better integrating the specific demands of women workers into trade union objectives. There is necessity of adjusting the organizations, structures, and procedures, and operations of day-to-day -day work in the unions to the conditions of life and work of women workers. So there is a need to promote women cadres in the, in the unions see, and women managers in cooperatives. So union need, I mean, unions need to develop alliances and coalitions and mutually supportive relationships with not only women's organizations, but other professional bodies, I mean like yours, that exist see, at community and at national level. So in short, what I would like to say is that uh, that, that informal sector is the future of labor movement and where women are leaders. And, and my last point, may I? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that when, I mean, when, when cal, I mean, capital is globalizing uh, say, and markets are globalizing, and, uh, and when decisions are taken at global scale in global um, capitals, there is a need for the workers also to emerge as a global force. So today, when corporations gain more power, the ILO is, is hard pressed to defend workers' rights, but the ILO does not have power over government or employers so much. So employers no longer need to compromise with labor. And governments are led to believe that um, deregulation and flexibility are essential to create jobs, as if they are champions of employment generation. Uh, so, so they need flexibility and essential to create jobs, to, I mean, to growth of employment. I mean that labor rights are obstacles. Labor rights have got new dimensions today, new challenges for workers' movement. So empowering workers through their organizations is as important as we talk of restructuring the market or reforming the state. That is where we see the new hope of the new, of the new economy. I mean, nobody likes to feel hopeless. See, and therefore, as Dan Galin says, that organize, democratize, and politicize. Thank you. <laughs> Um, when uh, in the trade union movement in uh, South Africa in the 1970s and 1980s, we were organizing workers, we organized in a context where the labor laws didn't uh, really cover the workers that we were organizing. 
because our trade union movement uh, organized black workers who according to the laws were not defined as employees. So as far as the laws were concerned, they were not actually workers or, in, or employees. Um, only white uh, so-called colored and Indian workers were regarded as employees and all the uh, industrial conciliation institutions that existed um, only existed for trade unions that didn't have black workers. So those of us in the black uh, trade union movement where, well, we, we had a, a non-racial trade union movement, but where, uh, w as long as there was one black worker, we were organizing people that weren't officially defined as, as workers. They were working and they were earning wages and they were being exploited, but according to the laws, they were not defined as such. So we had to organize workers in the context where the labor laws didn't really help very much. So we basically had to change the laws, and that's what eventually happened. Um, we built up the trade union movement and once uh, we had uh, got to the stage of having a new government, the labor laws were changed. Um, the bargaining institutions that existed in those days were exclusive. Uh, the trade unions of black workers were not uh, admitted to be part of those bargaining institutions. Therefore, they were not able to be part of the institutional mechanisms through which um, uh, labor standards were created, basic wages were created. Um, and as a result, most of the um, unskilled workforce and the majority of the workers, even though they were not defined as such, were excluded from the uh, labor relations mechanisms. So again, uh, those had to be transformed by the labor movement. Um, in the course of that, uh, the working class movement, the trade union movement in South Africa, was a very important part of the anti-apartheid struggle. It was a very important part of the democratization movement that took place. And when we got to the point uh, of eventually having a new government, which we elected in 1994, uh, many of the um, leaders which have come to run the government, uh, come to, some of them are in business now, um, uh, they are in, many of them are cabinet ministers, many of them are provincial ministers, came from that trade union movement. So it was basically a social movement which both fought for a political transformation and it also created the laws and the institutions that it needed. Now, uh, those of us who are organizing workers in the informal sector, uh, and let me talk very specifically about street vendors as a particular class of workers who also find that they don't have laws that apply to them. Uh, because the labor laws don't really recognize self-employed workers. Um, they don't really recognize workers who uh, are not employees with employers. Uh, but despite the fact that they are not recognized by the laws, they exist. They work many, many hours every day. They work many more hours than those who are officially recognized to be workers. Uh, because there's a 45-hour working week for those who are officially recognized to be workers. The other workers work quite a lot in excess of the 45-hour working week. So again, we find ourselves in the situation where we are organizing workers who uh, are not um, covered by laws, or there are the, the kind of laws that cover people like street vendors are uh, municipal bylaws. Many towns uh, don't yet have municipal bylaws, but those bylaws talk more about how street trade will be regulated, and there's very little protection uh, or, or regulation of the conditions under which those workers work. So again, we are now facing a situation where we are organizing those workers, and we are having to uh, decide what kind of laws we want to be there. We're having to make up our own legislation as we go along. We are having to test the laws that exist against the very wonderful new constitution that we have in South Africa, a constitution that guarantees uh, non-discrimination, <coughs> guarantees uh, the right of people to earn their living, guarantees a number of rights that we didn't have in the old South Africa. But many of the laws that we have are in contravention of that new constitution. So the trade union movement that we are involved with now, um, part of what it is doing is testing those old laws against the new constitution, Hopefully, uh, we're going to be throwing some of them out, and hopefully, we're going to be creating some new ones. Uh, similarly, um, when it comes to street vendors negotiating for their rights to make a living by selling in the street, the bargaining institutions that we would like to see are also non-existent. Uh, so we have to create them. Uh, we have to approach uh, municipalities 
with uh, demands from the street vendors uh, and ask them to agree to the issues that we demand. We have to negotiate with them until we achieve something that we can agree on. And we basically have to set up a pattern of uh, collective bargaining. Sometimes that's in the form of bilateral meetings between street vendor organizations and municipalities, and sometimes it's in joint forums. But basically, uh, we are in the process of creating those collective bargaining institutions. And again, the other thing that we are doing is um, building up leadership, a new class of leadership. Uh, it's a working class women's leadership uh, in the informal sector. So um, that is just to give you an idea of how uh, we've used our um, trade union experience uh, in a period of struggle uh, in, in South Africa up to 1994 in a new context of organizing workers in the informal sector and building up a new uh, a, a new form of leadership um, in the new South Africa in the post-apartheid era. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, Pat here spoke of, the, of a more visible group, the street vendors. This time I'll talk about a less visible group among the invisible workers. <laughs> uh, these are the home workers. But before I go into that, let me describe the uh, organization which I represent here. We call it the International Network of Home Workers, HomeNet for short, which is essentially an international alliance of membership organizations in Asia, Africa, Canada, Australia, Portugal, and the UK. Right now, there are moves to expand uh, the organization into other parts of the world, like Latin America. The main concern of HomeNet is to promote the organization of home workers. And I think uh, Renana Ben will talk about uh, the value of organization later. Now, HomeNet Southeast Asia in particular was organized as a result of an ILO technical cooperation project which I headed and implemented from 1988 to 1996. And this covered Thailand, Indonesia, and the Philippines. And at the time, the project was entitled Rural Women Workers in the Putting Out System. And everybody laughed about it. Now, basically, the putting out workers are also what we call the home workers. And home workers are those who produce goods and services under subcontracting arrangements, also known as the putting out system, at a place of their own choosing, usually on a piece rated basis. So most of the time, they work from home. Uh, they are at the bo bottom of the global production or supply chain, which has emerged as the common mode of production under the new international division of labor. With the onset of globalization and trade liberalization, there has been an increasing tendency to decentralize production from a central factory to satellite production units in outlying parts of the world, such as in Asia and Latin America. Now, you'd have a multinational corporation who would outsource its products from cheap labor uh, countries. For example, the terracotta and ceramics that you buy from Crate and Barrel uh, <laughs> might, is likely to have been obtained or sourced from a village in Cebu and Pampanga in the Philippines or from Brazil in Latin America. The global supply chain is a multi-layered subcontracting chain that begins from a principal firm possibly located in a developed country like the US, who places an order for goods. For example, these Claiborne orders from a garments factory in the Philippines. Paulo Loren and Benetton orders from Thailand, and Nike and Reebok shoes from Indonesia. Products could be outsourced through intermediaries, sometimes several of them, not just one. There is a buying agent that orders it from another agent who places the order to a middle person in a village. And finally, it gets down to the home worker in the village who actually produces the product. The actual producer could well be a woman in an urban slum of Bangkok or a rural village in East Java. If you fo follow or track the global supply chain, also called the value chain, you will find that the home worker gets a pity share of the value of the product she makes. For instance, you could be buying a t-shirt for 15 US dollars that is made in the Dominican Republic, and the home worker is likely uh, to be getting only something like 10 cents to 50 cents for her labor. 
All over the world, there are numerous home workers in the north and in the south. In Asia alone, it is estimated, for example, that there are something like 30 million home workers in India and 20 million in China, which are likely to be underestimates. Our statisticians are working on these figures right now, and this is part of the WIGO project. Home workers are uh, believed to contribute to the export sector something like 40 to 50 percent of the gross value. In the Philippines, I can say that the informal sector has actually helped us through the hard times, through the Asian financial crisis, through the many other crises that we have undergone. But home workers, like most informal sector workers, are invisible, unprotected, sometimes exploited. They are fragmented and unorganized. Some have described them as being atomized because they operate from their homes individually and they don't communicate with each other like the trade unionists. Their employment is precarious, orders are unstable, incomes are irregular. They work without any written contracts and are therefore vulnerable to exploitation. Now, homework is at the crossroads of gender and class. Many home workers are women and many, though not all of them, are poor. As uh, so was mentioned earlier, home workers could be doing as many as 21 different activities in a week or in a month. Uh, this we have seen in an urban slum, Jilambarbaru, in Jakarta. So a woman could be uh, chopping jelly, attaching a ribbon to uh, children's socks, stitching garments, whatever can bring her the money that she needs. When a home worker does not get an order as a subcontracted worker, she may simply produce a product and directly sells it to the market. And so the divide between the formal and the informal sector begins to blur. Finally, I'd like to make a last point, and this has to do with organizing in Southeast Asia. How did we get to become a home net? I must say that there were many challenges. The first imperative was finding where the, where the women are how to locate them. There were no rosters, there were no records of the women, they were completely undocumented. So in our language, we call it patanong tanong, which means you ask people where they are. You go from person to person and ask. And so you have a snowballing effect until you get to the women. So that was the one major task. The second one was finding competent organizers who were willing to stay in the village, immerse in the village, live with the women, motivate the women to form themselves into organizations. There was a lot of reluctance on the part of the women to organize because they were fearful of losing their jobs. In fact, it happened. At least there were two cases where some of our home workers lost their jobs because of their organizing work. The second thing was finding partners who would do this task of organizing. And here I partnered with community-based organizations, people's organizations, NGOs, to help us in organizing women. Trade unions came later in the game. I'm get, uh, being given the signal for time. So I will say that in addition to this, we had to conduct focus group discussions, surveys, a mix of different methods to get to the women and to organize them. At this stage of the game, we now have from a group of 20 women home workers as members of the home net. In the Philippines, we have 15,000 women home workers. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Um, I actually wanted to speak briefly about uh, the organization I come from, which is SEVA. And in this era of globalization, um, how can one make local voices um, heard at the global level? How do you go from the local to the global and still strengthen the organizing at the local level? Um, SEVA is Self-Employed Women's Association. It was formed in 1972 with a group of women head loaders who carried load on their heads. And what they found was that the rates they were getting for carrying cloth from one shop to another was really low. And they wanted to do something about it, but there were no unions for them. And SEVA was formed as a trade union for people 
for whom there were no unions who weren't employees. And we decided on the name self-employed because, not because it means um, somebody who lives only on their own, but because it's a much more dignified name for somebody who works to be self-employed. The next group of workers who joined, so I think what happened from that was that it slowly began to be recognized that it's not only employ employees and people in the factories who are workers, but there are all kinds of people in all kinds of employment relationships who are workers, and that recognition now has sort of filtered up and um, there are new laws which don't necessarily only relate to employees. The second group of people who came to SEVA was street vendors. Um, Pat has talked about street vendors in South Africa. The conditions of street vendors are more or less the same throughout the world, that they're really not, there's no space for them, and so they are considered illegal. And when they first came to us, to SEVA, they said that they were always being beaten by the police and driven away by the municipality. And because they could pay bribes, they could still stay. And when we first started organizing it, we start, thought it was against the police, then we thought it was, we had to talk to the municipality. Um, and we did organize a strong union of street vendors. But then we realized that in fact, there was a much, much deeper policy. And if, when we traced the laws back, we found that the municipal laws were actually from the British poor laws, had been coming down generation after generation. And we, in India, when we got uh, independence, we just adopted the old British poor laws, at least as far as it applied to the street vendors. And so slowly the campaign has built up, and now there is an international alliance of street vendors which is addressing this problem, or trying to address this problem of street vendors in the city. The street vendors and then some other workers who came in also had problems with credit. They said that they borrowed um, capital from the money lender, and sometimes they usually paid 10% um, a month, but sometimes even as high as 10% a day. But they said that, you know, they were working, they had money, they said, why can't we form our own bank? And that's how Seva Bank was formed, and that was way back in 74. And now, many years later, the World Bank is talking about microcredit. Um, so it does come from the local, and it's the solutions from the local which work. Um, many examples like that. Um, I think Ilaben has talked somewhat about employment. This is what we face when we first started working in the rural areas, is that people had skills, they were weavers, they were farmers, they were potters, but they were losing their employment either because there was no water for irrigation or there was no yarn for the weavers or there was no markets for the potters. So it wasn't you know, an automatic thing that was happening. There were market forces, there were political forces which was making that happen. So when they organized, Seva's role was to help women to organize, to get better skills, to get raw materials and then to link with the markets. In other words, to form organizations like cooperatives where the women who were the workers and the producers would control the, uh, both the raw materials and the markets or reach directly to the raw materials and the markets. Um, this whole issue of employment, when there's no employment, people have to migrate. We're working in some areas where, which are very dry areas where people have to migrate away for seven months in the year. And it's very traumatic when they go. They have, the children have to leave the schools and you know, people sort of mourn, they cry when they leave because it's like almost like a, almost a death when they have to leave the villages for seven months and then go away. But if one can create, and it is not really that difficult, what we found was that women in those areas had skills of embroidery. It just needed a link with the markets. They were working in salt pans, but the salt pans belonged to traders, and all it needed was for those women to form themselves into cooperatives and then take the salt pans and sell it themselves directly. And we were able to bring down the migration by 80%. Um, and we found that, you know, water is a real issue, and it's a women's issue, because it's the women who have to fill the water. Um, and 
now we are in the process of or um, of uh, seeing the women mount their own campaign where they say that the control of the water should be in their own hands you know not decided say at the state capitals um, I think what I'd like to do is also now talk a little bit about what are the challenge. Seva is expanding slowly. It took a while. It takes a long time to organize. And the strength really to make these changes happen is only through women coming together, people coming together, supporting each other, and creating a solidarity. Um, what we see now as the challenges, and I think these are not just local challenges, they come up where we see them right at the grassroots level, but they're really international challenges in some way. For us, the one challenge we see is direction, that our organization, um, what we have been promoting is the trade union organizing many different cooperatives. Um, which, where the women then become both the, the, become the users, the owners, and the managers. And what we see as our new direction is how do you convert the organizations into movements? Um, because it's not just enough to organize, you have to change the policies. And you have to affect the policies not only nationally, but also at the global level. Um, and in order to make this movement, one needs to have many allies. I talk about just one type of ally, which is with the researchers. Um, and one of the things we are, have been able to do is work with researchers at the national level to try and show how important these workers are to the economy. And in India, for example, there are 90% of the workers are in this informal economy. So they contribute 63% of the GDP and about 50% of the savings. And I think the situation would be the same in most developing countries. The second challenge that we really face is um, people, earlier it was thought that the public sector, that the government would take care of social protection and would look after people, and now it's not so anymore. Um, and what we see as a solution is that people to have social protection and employment through people's organizations. Because until power comes as close to the people as possible, um, it won't be, we won't be able to deal with globalization. So the challenge we face is how do you help women to create their own organizations? How do you create grassroots managers, barefoot doctors, um, water technicians, grassroots researchers, video cooperatives, these are all you know, areas where women who may be not that literate but are extremely motivated. And we find that it does work, that with some capacity building, they do create their own organization. Um, finally, I think what I'd like to say is that there are a number of other, the whole issue of urban, reclaiming the urban settlements, the urban services, that's a whole new area. Insurance, we found that women can run their own insurance companies. Um, and insurance being the next step from microcredit. But this is only really possible through organization and mutual support. And the reason really is that organization gives identity, hope, support, and respect. I think respect has been most important for our members. Just to end with one example, um, this is a, a woman from a very poor village called Puriben, <coughs> who, you know, in, women in India don't really say their own name. Nobody calls them by their own name. They are always called by the wife of so-and-so or the mother of so-and-so. And Puriben, you know, she didn't even know how to say her own name. Um, she was, whenever she was called to any kind of, um, uh, in her own social circle, it was always the mother of so-and-so. But then she joined the organization. She created in her own village uh, um, two, uh, three major cooperatives. And now when somebody comes to the village, it's not that it should be the mother of so-and-so who's called. It's always, where is Puri Ben? And she feels very proud. She tells people, I am Puri Ben. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, everyone.
every uh, uh, show uh, needs uh, what they, in the wrestling world they call a heel or a villain. And, and when I was first, Marty first asked me, he said, I said, you really want an economist here? Um, and do you want me to represent the World Bank, the IMF, or which villainous organization uh, in, in this process? And then if my mother ever finds out that I'm criticizing these brave, innovative women, you've really gotten me into trouble. Uh, but what I'm going to do is, is indeed use some of the, of the, of the words that uh, we economists use. And uh, the word came up, uh, the very first uh, presentation, flexibility. And one of the lessons I draw from, from the uh, examples of the cases we have before us is indeed that worker organizations are incredibly flexible, that they form under all kinds of situations, and that unions, which in the US we tend to think of as being largely uh, Movie stars are organized, we know. Professional athletes are, are organized, and doctors are organized. Um, and then there's some remnants of people who are organized uh, uh, from, from the 1930s uh, and so forth. That indeed, w one can have among workers outside the, f the formal sector, not employees of great institutions like Harvard, who also form their own uh, organizations. So worker organizations are incredibly flexible, key, key, key word. Um, and the different ways of organizing them from snowball to, uh, 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 to things like that. Second of all, I think the, the flexibility word should apply to the strategies that these different organizations use, ranging from changing uh, labor laws to being involved in, 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 lo in loans and, and, and various uh, ways of giving people uh, a greater dignity and, and rights. So I'm endorsing the, the word that's often used villainously, <laughs> flexibility, and turning it uh, around. Th th that I think is one of the lessons here uh, 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 that we should uh, draw. Then there's another thing, of course, uh, uh, economists always would, will bring up is, my goodness, you need the capital market, and capital is incredibly flighty. So if you improve the situation of some group of workers in one country, well, we're, we're going to put our money up, up to another country. Well, we've just heard uh, from Anana that a large fraction of the savings in India may indeed be coming from informal sector people, and that's capital. And that capital, I assume, is not floating off uh, somewhere else. But there are important ways, I think, that these organizations uh, can improve the well-being of people, which A, make no possibility of capital flight, and then I want to talk about ways that, that, do, that do indeed raise, raise that uh, uh, danger. There are numerous ways in which people's lives can be made better when they take actions by themselves and they make changes, and the, the word dignity was used and so on, uh, which don't really raise the price to any uh, capital uh, thing, uh, any, any, any uh, indeed may even lower the price, treating people decently, uh, need not have extra, extra costs. But it, it is true that ultimately the, the long-term goal is obviously that people's living standards get better. For that, they have to become more productive, um, and that takes a long, long period of, of time. In the shorter term, I think it's, it's extremely important to understand that the money that we pay, and the US is a big player in, in, in this business, but all the OECD countries are, uh, that is what, what in large part drives the global economy. And the $15 t-shirt being mentioned, uh, what the real lesson of that is, if it's 10 cents for the worker, if it goes up to 15 cents, you all can pay $15 and five cents uh, extra without bringing great, great harm, har harm to you. And I do think, I have to bring a little mathematics since I, since I found out you're a mathematician. Uh, but one of the more exciting things, uh, now it's, it's, it's been published in Nature and so on, it, it, it's, the, it's the small world theorem. It's how everybody is connected through incredibly limited steps. And you think about the, these women here, okay, they know uh, poor workers in these countries. A lot of us here don't. We now have one step away from those poor workers. Um, and the, the word invisible was interesting in the title here, because I thought the whole point of this is that 
in this modern world, these people do not have to be invisible any longer to us. And then once the information and the visibility is there, the question becomes, I think, how we can help uh, these people in their, in their ac activities. Um, as an economist, of course, I think money is the best way to help anybody. Um, <laughs> and so be it. Uh, but we have to ask in that respect, uh, which groups or where we can be allies uh, in helping pressure companies to pressure people uh, in order to create space for these organizations to operate and improve the well-being of their members. We do not have the knowledge uh, as to what it is that's going to help the street vendors uh, in, in these countries or, 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 or the home workers. Uh, so the, I think the key issue is what we can do as an advanced, very well-to-do society to allow uh, these people to have some power in their own settings to help them in some sense uh, improve their own uh, uh, situation. And the, li the, the, the links are interesting. It's wonderful that Kennedy School is having this, this event because it is making visible and, and raising the, these kind of issues. You know, we've had in the, in the world this stuff where city to city organizations. I don't think we've had Western organizations linked up with these types of organizations in a direct way. The glo these global things clearly are a step in, in that uh, 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 direction. But I think we should view ourselves, and the bottom line, uh, as, as, as helpers and as, and as sisters of, of, of these folks, not as, uh, you know, big Western philanthropists coming in and uh, throwing money around. The World Bank has done that. <laughs> the various aid programs have done that, and it's a, it's a, it's a largely right-wing economist cr criticism, but a correct criticism, that many of these programs have utterly failed because they have gone through the top rather than through the, the, uh, the bottom. And I think the, the lesson, the global, local thing is, is, is indeed uh, critical, and I think our, our goal should be how we can help the local groups, because I think the history is that going through the top, the corruption and, and things, that, that doesn't, doesn't really work. Thank, thank you. Thank you. We'd like to open it up now for your comments and your questions. And we have microphones on either side at this level, and I can't see up there. So um, if there's somebody up there, you might have to holler. Um, so please. Hi, my name is Sharmila Murthy and I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. My question is, given that everyone on the panel has addressed the issue of exploited workers and then globalization, and recently um, when the WTO talks were going on and there was all of these protests, you had people giving different arguments about, well, we need to protect the workers and protect their human rights so we shouldn't have trade, and then you had perhaps other people saying, well, actually these people, they need income and they need to export these products. And I was wondering what all of your perspectives were on this issue. Thank you. Lucy, wait a minute. You want me to answer it? Wow. <laughs> I have to answer that and it's a difficult question. Um, you know, the, it, I don't want to answer it in a black and white because um, it's not. Uh, there are two things. One is that, yes, indeed, it has happened, that we are getting very overwhelmed by decisions that are made in the North, that decisions that are made by big corporations, and we need to resist that. Um, and what happened at Seattle was one way of resistance, and it should be resisted. There's another side to it, too, which is that often resistance is also used by competing business interests for their own purposes. And that has also happened. And that's where you know a lot of the developing countries are talking about non-tariff trade barriers. And we have to see whether a certain protest is a non-tariff trade barrier or it is a um, resistance. Um, so, you know, I'm not, I, that's all I can say. Um, I think the last thing I would say wa would be that from our point of view, I mean, I don't want to give a general prescription, but from our point of view, we'd go issue by issue. What is good for our members, for our people, for our home-based workers, and for our street vendors, and take up the issue on that basis? Please. 
first I wanted to share an experience that I've had for the past um, four years with you, and it kind of addresses some of the, I think the question, part of the last question. Um, I've been working with the Women Leaders Network, um, which is a network of women leaders from the 21 different co um, countries of APEC. Mm -hmm. They're women leaders who are from the public sector, private sector, academics, and civil society organizations. Now, I will confess they're a little weaker on the civil society end, but they are trying to form an alliance of what at times seem like unusual bedfellows. However, I think what's been really important to watch in this whole process, and it's been unusual for me because I came from a civil society background, and now I'm working with these people, some of whom are very, very wealthy, extremely powerful, very influential leaders within their own economies, um, and they've been collaborating to lobby APEC to take two things into consideration. One is women's contribution to the economy within that global area, and the other is what are women's specific needs. And you can argue still that maybe it's still the elite that's still going to benefit more than um, the local women, but um, the sense I've gotten from working with these women is they're working on behalf of the women that they represent, because they are all, all leaders from these different sectors. Within a four-year period, we've gotten uh, put a lot of pressure on APEC. They've now adopted gender as a cross-cutting cutting issue in all of their programs poli and policies. They have developed a framework to integrate women into APEC, and we're waiting to see what the results are. We will stand back and be the monitoring of to see what, what kind of impact this really has. But by working together, that kind of alliance that uh, you were talking about, it can be very, very effective. And I think what we need to do is bring in even more local leaders to help give input into that process so that we come up with some more, even more effective strategies. Do you want me to go No. Okay. I believe there's somebody up there, I'm told, although I can't see. Yeah. Um, yes, I have a question that's really related to the legal framework and a lot of the issues that you raised around protection. And on the one hand, what I have found in a lot of countries that I've worked in, that there are all these battles with municipalities that are usually trying to um, kind of put into practice things that will control street vendors or declaring work at home illegal and it is invisible. On the one hand, people want that visibility, but then with that visibility comes taxation and fees and licensing and all of these other kind of issues. And I was wondering if somebody could talk about how you've dealt with that particular contradiction. I'm sure Pat will. Pat. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, you know, uh, I don't know if there's a different perspective on this in different uh, regions, but we came across the notion that uh, when we were at the ILO arguing for a, a convention on informal work, and there were members of the labor movement who said that they felt that members of the informal sector preferred uh, to remain invisible because of the uh, disadvantages of having to pay tax. Um, and in, in certain countries in North America and Europe, where informal work has been illegalized and uh, it, it's called uh, underground work and black work and so on. They, in that situation, they said people also wanted to remain invisible. Um, we don't experience that uh, in, say, uh, not only South Africa, but many other countries where we have more open informal economies where um, the invisibility is not necessarily a, a question of people hiding from the public eye. Um, and with more visible people like street vendors, you find that actually the costs of, of um, illegality or invisibility are often higher than the costs of proper taxation. And if I take the example of street vendors, and recently a study that has been done in Nairobi on street vendors has shown this very clearly. Street vendors who have uh, a permit to trade in Nairobi have to pay a certain uh, fee, and that is um, uh, uh, income to the municipality, and that is a form of tax. Uh, those who don't have a license have to pay um, protection money, they have to pay bribes, they have to pay probably about three times more than they pay if they are recognized and legal. So it, it appears in many cases, and as I say, it may be different in different situations. In most parts of the developing world, our organizations have discovered that there's a far greater desire for visibility and legitimacy and being part of the 
uh, benefits uh, of, of being a recognized part of the economy. For example, being able to uh, be part of the social security system, being able to be regarded as part of the economy generally. The advantages of that kind of visibility uh, seem to be far greater in the minds of most of our members than uh, any advantage of being invisible. And as I say, uh, in many of our countries, there doesn't appear to be an advantage of being um, invisible. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Sandra Ng. I work with Oxfam. Uh, my question today is regarding measurements of success in your work. Um, increasingly, NGOs are being asked to be accountable for the money they spend. What would you consider are your three top indicators of success, and how would you measure that? You mean success of, uh, of the members or success, success of Success of your organizing, because there's a common theme of organizing here today. But organizing in itself, is, is it an end in itself? or? I think, uh, I mean, one is the sustainability, that it has sustained over, over a period of time. The other thing is that the, when the member, I mean, our I mean, Seva woman, is able to face and, say, and talk, you know, face to face with the uh, village council head or, or with the police or with her husband, and, and she is able to so able to reply the question, to be able to talk. So I think that, that that is another so another indicator I would say, so which is empowerment. I, I mean the whole thing is for for um, for empowerment, to be able to manage one's own self, I mean financially and also in terms of taking decisions. And the third would be that she has. I mean, she's the owner of the asset. It may be land, it may be house, because we have found that those who have, so amongst poor, I mean, those who have a, a little bit of asset is able to fight vulnerability, I mean, far better than those who are totally assetless. So to be able to be the owner of the asset and to be able to sustain that, you know, asset in her name. I think three. <laughs> Please do see. Well, maybe I can give you some examples to demonstrate the kind of uh, impacts that the organizing has done. Uh, for instance, um, in the case of the Philippines, we have now reached a point where the Philippine Department of Labor itself has initiated the drafting of a Magna Carta for the informal sector. That's one. Uh, second is in another instance, the uh, home workers were able to solicit something like three million pesos in revolving funds to support their economic projects. So if you want to think in terms of concrete terms like that, then uh, this is, these are the examples. But in general, I think what is important is that as a result of the organization, the women really gain a voice. They are represented in decision making. During the Ramos administration, for example, we now have the women are represented in the formation of formulation of the uh, social reform agenda. In the case of Thailand, for instance, the uh, Ministry of Social Welfare of Thailand has set up a home workers unit and has finally decided that they will start enumerating home workers and the informal sector in their national labor force surveys. So there are very concrete things that the uh, movement and the organization has led into. Thank you. Yes. Hi, my name is Kathleen Hamill. I actually teach a course in international human rights law and policy nearby at Tufts University. And I'm wondering what role you think um, US consumers and activists have to play in your particular causes, if there is one, and um, how you would like to see that play out, particularly in the case of home workers. Well, actually, there's one very concrete thing now that probably needs uh, further, sorry, further intensification. One is this movement to uh, enforce a code of conduct um, where companies which are known uh, to employ sweatshop, I mean, people, uh, uh, I mean, women and children, 
in sweatshop conditions can be sanctioned or censured by way of consumer boycotts, for example. Of course, that's a tricky one, no? because it may also lead to some undesirable effects for the home workers themselves. But what I'm saying is this is one mechanism, but it has to be practiced with a certain amount of sobriety. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so code of conduct is one, and then uh, another would be uh, the north-south type of linkages to inform, uh, to inform the home workers about the conditions of work and whether they're accepted. You see, what happens is, if a home worker, let's say, in the Philippines decides not to accept it, a company can always take it to Bangladesh or to any other uh, cheap labor country. And that's very easy to do for them. But if there is a network, through that network, you could share the information and decide on a particular position or stance. So there are ways of doing it, and this can be developed over time. Thank you. I just want to go back to, uh, I think, what was a very important issue, the, the so-called the cost and the so-called benefits or advantages of being invisible. And as been uh, rightly uh, stated, uh, invisibility also uh, uh, lacks dignity. And that's why it's so important of people in the informal sector to become visible. Uh, what always has struck me as uh, fascinating is that uh, this dichotomy between formal and informal uh, sector is only illustrated and commented upon in terms of labor and never of capital. Uh, and I think that's a very important issue which uh, economists have totally neglected, or not totally, but most uh, economists have neglected it for a, a very long uh, time indeed. And what you have to look at is the hidden transfers from the informal sector to the formal sector, where the money is whitewashed. And I'm not saying mafia money, I'm not saying black money informal sector money, where the sweat of informal sector labor is being transferred and converted into formal sector capital. Uh, in the city where I did my uh, research, uh, 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 some of my research on informal sector labor, according to estimates of uh, bankers in that city, 60% of the total money circulation was, was black money circulation, Kalu, as they say in, uh, in Gujarat, or number B, which is not registered, which is not accounted for. And there is an, uh, a very interesting, a very intriguing reluctance of economists to stretch the informal, formal sector uh, dichotomy from labor into capital. And uh, some of the problems we are talking about can only be solved if we also take that into consideration, the informalization of capital, the non-taxability of capital. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Lauren Benton from NJIT and Rutgers University. Um, there was an interesting case reported in the New York Times twice, actually, in the last couple of months about a group of women in a rural village, I believe in Suriname, who had gotten together and formed an organization mm -hmm. and put up a website to sell their weavings internationally. And uh, the unhappy uh, result of this was that some uh, male village elders had gotten together and seized the website and the organization from them. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know or couldn't hazard a guess about whether this uh, is, is a pattern or a foreshadowing or significant in any other way, but I was curious if any of you would like to hazard a prediction about the impact or the possible benefits of uh, or dangers of the internet and a web access for informal sector producers or organizations? Um, actually, you've raised two separate issues. One is the issue of the men taking away the yeah. benefits once they become sizable enough. And the second is it the was internet. A provocative example, but I'm more interested <laughs> in the internet, but go ahead. Okay. No, but the, we often get asked about the male-female issue, mm -hmm. that uh, you know, don't, well, don't the men object, and then don't the men take away um, the earnings once they start coming. 
Um, our experience has been that, um, you know, when women do start earning and getting um, money, then there's a lot of interest in not only, not only men, I mean, you know, not only the males of the household, but also political parties or bigger organizations. And that's where the whole issue of organization comes in, that, you know, if you, what you need to do is build up a strong enough organization so that it stays. And I think one, I mean, we don't have enough experience with the internet to say anything about it, but I do think that's perhaps the answer to the internet question too. It's a totally different technology, I do agree. Um, but I think what we've been trying to experiment with is how do you take advantage of this new e-commerce and um, opening up of the markets through this to get more orders? Um, because if we don't get it, somebody else will. Um, so we're seeing it more as an advantage rather than as you know somebody taking over the internet. But we'd be very open to any suggestions on how to create more empl employment and get more orders through the internet. Any additional questions? I still can't see up there. Any co more comments from the panelists? All right, let me just say a couple of words in conclusion. Um, the group that's assembled here for this week of events, uh, this global network, um, are going into a academic conference tomorrow for two days on rethinking the informal economy. And the conceptual blocks that we have been feeling um, and experiencing in dealing with policymakers and academics, and now I've taken off my academic hat and put on my, my activist hat, are of four kinds. One has to do with the persistence or the, in fact, the existence of the informal economy. And what we've found is that rather than uh, the formal sector or formal economy absorbing the surplus labor, in fact, it's the informal economy that is growing which is counter to uh, the conventional wisdom. In terms of the characterization of the informal economy as something different from the formal economy, we see it much more as a continuum, that there are intrinsic links, that there are new emerging forms of formal and new and emerging forms of informal, and that there's a continuum of employment relations that need to be much better understood in our global economy. In terms of the issue of regulations that has been raised here, and whether the informal sector, the conventional wisdom has that the informal sector is avoiding the costs of formality. And I think the perspective, the growing perspective of this group is that actually there are a lot of costs of informality, and if you uh, were more formal, you could enjoy the benefits of formality. And then when it comes to the question of international labor standards that has been touched upon, I think the perspective of this network is that um, it's unfortunate that it's being pitted that the debate on international labor standards <coughs> is being promoted by the protectionist interests of the North and resisted by the South. And the problem with that formulation is that there is not the voice of the worker of the South in that debate. It's the interests of the North versus the governments of the South. And what is missing in that debate is the voices of the workers of the South. And to pick up with what Richard left off on, what we have now is a remarkable range of organizations that do represent the voices of the workers of the South, especially the ones that are least visible. And the hope is that in the consumer campaigns that rather than it being the good uh, will of people in the North, that they would make it particularly clear that they should bring in uh, the voices that um, Koshik Basu, who teaches at the Kennedy School this year, calls it the muted voices of the workers of the South. And we now have been hearing how these voices are no longer muted and they need to be heard in these campaigns. And finally, I think what I would like to conclude with is that if we really want to harness the powerful forces associated with globalization for equitable ends that we do have to focus on the women who are the most invisible and the least powerful in the global marketplace. So thank you very much.
at Frappfront. She's coming to dinner with us. She's a professor here. Very nice. Ha, and she's a very she's a close friend of ours. And sitting uh, standing